Hello, I'm Victoria Pierce. I'm the Director of Endangered Heritage and I'm going to present a series of videos to help you understand what, how you can look after your things at home. One of the biggest concerns for a lot of people and even in our major historical collections is actually insect damage. Insects can sneak in almost anywhere and most of us have got the experience of putting on a jumper and finding a hole. So today I want to talk to you about things that you can do to protect yourself from insects and to remove some of the uh, unreasonable shame that people sometimes feel if they have got an infestation of moths or other insects that come in. Because really you shouldn't feel embarrassed. It's not about house cleanliness. It's not about um, the way you run your house. Um, if you've got moths, there, there's not an awful lot we can do about something that has 10,000 eggs and that many babies running through our place um, eating up our things. One of the big questions that people come to me with is why did they eat my cashmere jump hole? Why have they eaten the best thing that I have in my house, my most favourite thing? And the, the, the short answer is it's those historical objects and those things that we really care for that are of high quality that are actually made of natural fibres these days. Most of our house is full of synthetics, polyesters and nylons, which aren't yummy at all. So the things that are attractive to insects are things like wool, silk, um, feathers, leather, a lot of the protein things. Um, and so let's talk about why. Um, first of all, the two most common forms of moth that we have are case moth and webbing moth. And they are proteinaceous eaters, which means they go after those classically sort of wool and um, fur, feather, that sort of um, protein material. So anything that's come from an animal, you'll see will have damage. Now on this feather, you'll see there's a little bit of damage here and it's not insect damage. It's actually from the bird grooming itself with its own beak doing damage. Insect damage is a lot more, um, it's a lot e sort of more uh, identifiable as being a bit more spread out and peculiar. So you can see here on this bear, there's some very short, sharp edged cut sort of damage here on the fur that looks like um, more like insect damage and little characteristic holes. Some insects, um, particularly our moths and carpet beetle, they don't have chomping mouth parts like we do. They have rasping mouth parts that kind of grate off the surface of the fibre. And that leaves us with this surface that uh, we refer to as being grazed. And it means that the fibres have sort of been ground down until finally and eventually there is, there is a hole. Let's have a little talk about the most common types of insects. Firstly, like I said, there's case moth and um, webbing moth. And you'll often um, not see the actual moth. It's a very small straw-like um, uh, moth, but you will find the larva, the webbing or cases left behind by them. So case moth leave a little larva that have, uh, as they grow, they chomp at the fibers uh, that they're eating and if you like the crumbs they leave behind they attach to a little cocoon so they drag around this cocoon which is covered in the fibers of what it is they're grazing on so those little cocoons can be quite difficult to find my daughter when she was little used to refer to them as the little sleeping bags of the grubs because these little grubs literally have their head poking out eating as they're building up their sleeping bag to to go into hibernation to pupate Webbing moth is the moth that leaves long strands of webbing and looks a bit like spider web all over um, your object. The notable thing about any kind of insect is actually what we refer to as frass. And frass is actually insect poo. And you'll find it in the bottom of a box or in the bottom of a shelf, like small sand. It's like beach sand. And you think, how, how did all of this sand or dust get in here? Frass is often the first sign that there might be a problem because those insects have actually camouflaged themselves and you won't see them on a nice folded up cashmere jumper. 
for us when you're cleaning out things it becomes a little bit more obvious so keep a look out for that it's often the first sign that you've got an issue Carpet beetles, another one on the east coast that's really interesting. It's like a little tiny ladybird, but in sort of leopard tiger stripes, sort of a variegated um, pattern over its back. And the beetle is very small, so you really don't find them flying around. And she expels an egg to propel herself. So it means that every time she lands and goes to take off again, she leaves a leg behind rather than a cluster. So it's a bit of a lucky dip for her whether the babies have food there or not. So she could be quite strategic and land in all sorts of places, leaving eggs everywhere. So one carpet beetle can leave an awful lot of problem babies behind. The other thing is that there seems to be uh, larger moths that do not cause a problem to our collections like bogon moths, especially here in Canberra, but they do always tend to come with a little carpet beetle larvae attached to them like a parasite. That's the first food and then the carpet beetle pupates, goes into its adulthood, meets up with another and before you know it, you have 10,000 of them through your home. So those big moths that don't actually eat your jumpers and things are your first primary food. They're wildlife in your house that provide food for the next generation of wildlife. So good housekeeping does help quite a bit. The dangerous thing is putting things away in boxes, putting things away in the top of shelves and not checking on them, leaving them in the dark, leaving them in the top of the cupboard, which is always going to be a little bit warmer, where things go, oh, perfect, we've got a smorgasbord in here. Checking on things regularly is really important. So when you first of all open the box, sometimes it's good to just open your lid, feel inside, is there frass? Do any moths fly out? If they do, close the lid, bring it into us and we'll go through our freezer treatment process which I'll explain in a minute. If nothing flies out and there's nothing to worry about you can safely bring your object out of the box. The same goes for carpets and things. One of the biggest problems with putting things into storage is often there may be eggs and things already on them that you no damage visible yet. You roll up the object, you put it in a dark place, you store it, you bring it out and it's completely eaten. Um, especially because those bugs have had no other choice. They haven't been able to get out. Insects can do a huge amount of damage really quickly. Um, and carpet beetle larvae, which are the eating part of the life cycle, they are a have a ferocious appetite. Um, and again, uh, they have mouth parts that are designed just for those protein fibers. A lot of people think carpet beetle, beetle only eat carpet. And that's not true. Actually, they got their name from when we established wall-to-wall -wall carpet for the first time. Beetles and their larvae would migrate out of ceiling spaces and cavities when it got too hot in summer, come down the empty wall cavity under the skirting board and start munching on the available wall fiber. And so they got this reputation for eating carpet. Well, we brought the smorgasbord to the very skirting boards of the house, so that's of course what they started to eat. The truth is they don't just eat carpet. If there's no carpet there, if they come in under the skirting boards, they're going to look for anything that's protein. In Canberra particularly, and in a lot of homes, modern homes now, we have built-in wardrobes, which means those insects migrate down the wall, under the skirting board, into our built-in wardrobes. They haven't even come through the front door. So it can make it really tricky for us to do anything, um, you know, in terms of our housekeeping, other than checking on those dark, quiet places. We have a freezer treatment at Endangered Heritage and every single textile item comes in. It gets quarantined by freezing for 10 days at minus 10. I wouldn't recommend doing this at home. Most freezers that people have at home are actually uh, 
you know, have a, a cycle, a, or, you know, automatic defrost so that they don't have to be chipped out with ice like the good old days. And that means that the freezer's turning itself off at, a, at night time and making it um, possible for those eggs to actually just warm up enough that they survive the thaw. So it's really important that you put them in a proper freezer that's not on a cyclic defrost that goes to minus 10 for 10 days, which is what we do. We then brush vacuum everything very, very carefully to remove any eggs, dust and dirt and any of the pheromones that are left behind by the last generation so that things don't get reinfested. I, again, wouldn't recommend putting things in the freezer in your own home. I have had the sad story of one woman who decided that she'd save herself $60 and do it herself. And of course, when the family christening gown was in the freezer, that was when they had a power out and it ended up covered in ice cream and raspberries. So think about a dedicated space for that first step if you do want to do it yourself. Uh, after things have been frozen, we know that they're safe to put away. There's no eggs on them. So that's step one. We would never frame something without going through a freezer treatment and making sure it's got no eggs. Tragically, framers do tend to just put textiles in behind glass, trapping anything that hatches with no other choice but to eat your valuable artwork. Um, so it's really important to know that you're starting with something that actually doesn't have insect eggs on it and they're all microscopic, you can't see them. So once you know that your object has no um, eggs on it, let's talk about basic storage. Acid-free tissue boxing is your first line of defense. For garments, you might use a calico garment bag. Another thing that we do sell here, but is easy enough to make for yourself if you're handy with a sewing machine. And it's just a, a literally a coverall that provides your first line of defense. How does that work? Well, remember how I said all of these parasitic insects have got mouth parts designed to graze and rasp and only eat protein. They don't have the mouth parts to actually go through cotton and cellulose and plant materials. So by using plant materials, they can't get through. They're not interested. They are gonna fly on, try and find something else. So if you've got holes and insect damaging cotton objects, it isn't moth and it isn't carpet beetle. It's more likely to be silverfish. Silverfish are the only cellulosic grazers in Australia. Now one little word of advice, silverfish advertising and information on Google can be very, very misleading. There are silverfish in America and other places where, you know, the big brand pesticide companies sort of go, oh yes, you know, use our product, you'll kill all of your silverfish, blah, blah, blah. But um, our native silverfish here in Australia, they're actually more interested in plant material, leaf litter and their mouth parts are completely dependent on that leaf litter and that cellulose being moist. So if it's got to be moist, just removing the moisture actually will remove the silverfish. In fact, in our museums, if we see silverfish, we usually know that we're in for a plumbing leak or that there's a gutter that's leaking water into the storage area that we hadn't realized or a leak with an overhead fire sprinkler. Silverfish are a sign that we need to attend to building maintenance more than collection maintenance. Something's going wrong. Things are getting damp. Silverfish often will attack the cellulose in books or artwork on walls, the backing paper on artwork, the liner inside drawers. But in every single case, it's because that material was close to a bathroom that wet seal has failed or in a room where the garden has come up above the damp course of the brickwork, letting moisture into the building. Otherwise, silverfish don't come into our home. So always check for moisture. If you have got silverfish, they're probably coming up because of leaky pipe or leaky water dampening things. Dry it up, they'll go away. 
Um, I have had one gentleman tell me that he had a crack in his concrete slab that that was going to cost him $50,000 to fix. So he couldn't do anything about the moisture. What could he do then? And there are uh, insecticides that are specific for the silverfish that we sell that you can use in that circumstance. But back to the more common pests, which are protein ones, the moths and carpet beetle, we want to create a barrier that is not wool or protein. So another product that's really useful is Tyvek. It's quite crunchy and it's a very, uh, it's often, um, everyone's familiar with it. It's often used in um, post packs and its real name is uh, heat welded, poly punch, ne needle punched heat welded polyester. <laughs> it's a bit of a mouthful. It's brand name's Tyvek. Um, and we do sell this by the meter because it's, um, and it comes on a very, very large roll. So you're wrapping things up in Tyvek, making a sealed bag with Tyvek is a really useful tool. You can make also the dust covers with Tyvek. And the interesting thing about Tyvek is if you wash it many, many times, which is always a bonus if you can reuse things, um, it gets softer and nicer in actual fact when it's not new. So we tend to reuse and rewash our Tyvek quite a lot, which is nice for the planet if we can actually reuse things. So I'll just move these out of the way and we'll talk about, um, we'll talk about the actual pest control that we use in our museums and that you can use in your home. One is for moths and the other is for carpet beetle. And they're a pheromone based product they're not using a chemical insecticide. The problem with insecticides is they leave a residue. And as a textile specialist, I have been required to treat taxidermed objects that have been around 100 years, uh, for 100 years, and they've ended up with DDT and borides and arsenic powders and mercury powders, all sorts of generations, every 10 years, a different generation of chemical to try and compact combat the in insects. So a lot of them eventually they just don't work. Pheromone traps are the best the best form of um, controlling insects. So first of all if you've got a really big infestation use um, something like a pyrethrum flea bomb in the house to kill all the livestock, kill all of the adults and then you're at zero. So then the next step is what do we do with the eggs when they hatch? So um, the pheromone traps are great because they use the allure of love. So the insect trap here that I'm going to show you is the moth one. And this is the female pheromone. And so what it does is it just sends out the signal calling to all of the males, which then get caught on the very, very sticky trap and take them out of life cycle. It doesn't matter if there's females flying around, they're not fertile. So this little cover keeps the dust off that sticky trap so it stays sticky. This little pheromone comes out of its pack and sits on top of the sticky and it attracts the male moth from all around your house. One little warning, make sure your fly screens are all in good order or you're going to be pulling in insects from all around the suburb. The one thing about being a tiny little critter trying to find the perfect love of your life out there in the wilderness is your pheromones pack a real punch because you have to find another tiny little critter. That means that one of these traps will do your whole house. Trust me when I say that, this. It's meant to be like a lighthouse, like a beacon that pulls the males from everywhere. If you put too many of these lighthouses around your house, it confuses them. There's so much pheromone filling up your whole home that they don't know where to go. So you lose all of them. They're just going to hang around doped up with pheromone looking for the love of their life. One one as a beacon and it's a lure it's a beacon it's attracting the insects to it it's not an insecticide it's not killing them 
It's luring them. So don't put this in amongst your jumpers and your furs. Otherwise, you're just luring them to the best smorgasbord they've ever had. If you actually lure them away from the furs, away from the yummy things, put it perhaps underneath the sideboard that has your ceramics, your, your dinner set or something in it that they can't eat. Lure them towards a safe place. This particular trap's really useful too because it has a location, a date and a catch number. So what it can do is it can help you to actually find the epicenter of your infection. So you might put it in the dining room underneath the sideboard and catch two moths. And then a week later, you might put it in the spare room and catch 10 moths. And a week later, you might put it in the master bedroom. Again, away from the yummy things, perhaps on the dressing table. And you might catch 164 moths and you know the problem's in this room. Time to start doing a proper strip down, trying to find the epicenter and what it is that's actually spreading the infection through the house. Make sure that you don't relocate objects that have been in contact. Isolate them. Don't suddenly go, oh my God, the master bedroom's got moths. I'm going to take everything out of there and put it in the spare bedroom because you're just spreading the infection. You actually need to just start being sensible, bag things, quarantine things, dry clean clothes, that'll kill eggs as well. Washing them won't, neither will putting them out in the sunshine. That's where the bugs came from in the first place. So this can be used to find that epicenter by moving it around. Um, and then you can actually start cleaning up. Some of the things that we've found from experience often get overlooked and become the epicenter. Old teddy bears or toys that are put away. Often ski boots that are nice and sweaty that have got um, fur lining in the bottom of them and you haven't gone skiing this season so they've just sat in the cupboard undisturbed. Uh, sleeping bags that may have feathers and things in them and haven't been used for a while. So camping gear with nice yummy natural fibers. That um, They're all things that we have found from clients in the past tell us have become a, a real problem. Obviously no amount of insecticidal poison, no amount of anything is going to be you know, effective if you haven't found that epicenter. So keep a look out for that. With the carpet beetle, same thing. It's a pheromone trap, it's a lure, it takes the males out of circulation. Again, it has quite, quite a uh, sophisticated little dust cover so that the sticky pheromone, which you peel, sit in here and then cover, doesn't get wasted on dust. It gets, actually attracts the beetle that climbs in here. Again, put this away from the yummy smorgasbord that those protein-eating insects are, are interested in. Um, perfectly safe for pets, it's a pheromone. It's the hormone that attracts the insect. So that's all I want to say about the really safe things that we can do to look after our collections in, in our own home. There is one thing that I do want to say, which is quite a serious warning against some of the practices that people are using in their home. And that's the use of naphthalene and mothballs. Both of these products are actually really, really toxic. They're toxic, they build up in our human tissue, in our lungs, in our liver, in our fatty tissue. And when we get old and we need that fat store because we've maybe taken a fall or we're sick, that fat store gets pulled upon and those toxins get re-released. They're accumulative poisons. And, you know, mothballs have actually been banned in China in 1995. Anything banned in China, we should probably pay attention to as being pretty toxic for us. The irony about the use of mothballs and naphthalene is that insects have become quite resistant to them, so they don't impact on them at all. They don't like it, they might move to the next object, but it doesn't kill them. It does have an accumulated um, effect on, on us. And sadly, three children a year in Australia die on average from mothballs and mothball poisoning. 
and most importantly, that's from taking beautiful layettes and grandma's blankets that she's put away for 40 years waiting for the next grandchild to be born and bringing it out, thinking that a little wash will be enough and putting that blanket onto a baby newborn in its crib. It's really sad, it doesn't get enough publicity and it's something that I really want to speak quite strongly about. So don't use pesticides and insecticides, don't use mothballs and naphthalene. Look at using pheromones as an alternative and look at your habits. If these are things that you really care about, check on them. Take a little look. They're not that safe in the dark. Have a little look at them and just make sure that they are safe for the next generation. We're here to help you look after your heritage at Endangered Heritage. So follow us on our website for updates. You'll find that there's a link to insects and in our disaster recovery area. And look out for more of our videos on disaster recovery and other problems that you can experience in your collection.